So, that's up there. Yes. Welcome, everybody, uh, to the HRPC Policy Committee meeting. It's May 20th, 2022, 9 10 a.m. Uh, and we have people uh, both in the room as well as people attending remotely. We have a quorum in the room. Uh, if we could start out by identifying ourselves, we'll start with Bill. Bill Fisher, Foreman. Rick Michel, Salvatore. Peter Nelson, New Market. Michael Williams, Toast. Barbara Holstein, Rochester. Wendy Davidson, the Hanson Community. Karen Golab, Milton. Uh, Larry Brown, Milton. Tom Crosby, Maverick. Dave Landry, Dover. Jen Sue, Stratford Regional Planning. Cool. Alan Lentz, Stratford Regional Planning. And online, we have uh, Tim White, DES. Good morning, uh, Tim White, New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. And staff, yes. Sure, um, if everyone wants to maybe wave, I'll say who's who. Uh, we've got, <laughs> wait till your name's called in. <laughs> Natalie Moles, <laughs> James Burdeen, uh, Zuzi Duffy, calling in from Norway, I might say. Um, uh, <laughs> Rachel Dewey, uh, Stephen Geis, Mark Davey, and Jackson Rand. Oh, sorry, and Megan at the home, the gray square. Okay. She has her camera off. And I'll, I'll just add that uh, Karen and uh, Larry are from Milton, and this is their first meeting. We welcome them. Thank you. Great to have you. Glad to be here. Okay, so we'll move on to the uh, economic development district portion, EDD and Collins. James, sorry, James and Natalie. James and Natalie. Good morning, all. Um, so we're here this morning because we have been working on an update to our comprehensive economic development strategy. Megan, would you be able to enable screen sharing, please? Um, we, uh, you know, as we've been discussing a few times over the course of the year, the SEDS is our core plan for um, the economic development district hat that we wear. And we update that plan on a five year cycle um, where we do a large overhaul of the you know, vision, the goals, the themes in. Um, the first year and then each of the subsequent years, uh, we're doing more of a data update, a progress report on um, our projects, things like that. So we are here uh, today because we have released the 2022 update of the SEDS for public comment. Um, so we have a complete draft that's published on our website. We wanna give you a brief overview of those comments and then take a look at the process uh, for soliciting comments and moving towards adoption, um, and then finally provide some time for commissioner feedback if people have had a chance to take a look at that plan yet. Um, as I said, we released the plan, the draft plan on May 6th. It's available on our website. We also have hard copies posted at the Dover, Rochester, and Summersworth Public Libraries and Planning Offices. Um, so we're going to take a quick spin through all of the themes, give you just the highlights of what we talked about, um, and go from there. So Natalie, you're up first. Thanks, James. Good morning, everyone. Um, starting off with our first theme of economic growth, um, we took a look at inflation, noting that the New England Consumer Price Index increased drastically compared to the previous year. Um, you can see the plan for more details, but I do want to note that some inflationary factors causing this have been monetary and fiscal policies, supply chain disruptions, labor shortages, and just geopolitical tensions around the world. Next, we take a look at labor force participation in Stratford County, noting that by the end of January of this year, there were, were we still about 3,000 people short compared to pre-pandemic levels. Um, likewise, unemployment, both in terms of percentage and number of claims, those are both lower than pre-pandemic levels. As far as policy actions and government support programs that we've seen over the past year, we had the continuation of programs like PPP, 
the economic injury and disaster loan, unemployment benefits and economic impact checks, as well as the financial assistance to state and local fiscal governments through the state and local fiscal recovery fund, which distributed about 23 million to our region's 18 municipalities. For resiliency action for this theme, we have helped connect public sector entities with private businesses um, to support business resiliency plans and also provide technical assistance that supports business operations. That brings us to our next theme, business operations. Um, for this, we saw growth in the number of businesses in several of our municipalities. This includes uh, businesses that relocated both from inside of the state as well as from other parts of the state. We saw staff so shortages and disruptions in supply chains that have limited business operations. This re uh, resulted in a reduction of business operation hours as well as an increase in cost of goods and services. Office, as far as office vacancy rates go, we saw those had increased some as companies downsize in their, in their physical space due to remote work but it wasn't as much as we expected. And we believe that it's because some of the long-term leases are still in place. So we might see an increased vacancy rate in the, in the remainder of 2022 and 2023. There was a high demand for industrial and warehouse and distribution spaces around New Hampshire. Um, not a lot of inventory, so not enough to support growth, which has led to very low vacancy rates in this category. Our resiliency action for this theme is to encourage practices such as resiliency plans, diversification of suppliers, and encourage businesses to adapt to current conditions. Our next theme is housing. Um, here we saw some stabilization and trends over the past year when compared to the year before, but still not back to pre-pandemic levels. In Stratford County, the median sales price as well as the list price received have, con have continued to increase year over year. The number of closed sales has decreased lately, but this is not due to lack of demand, but due to the lack of supply and just the rising costs of housing, which includes the recent um, mortgage interest rate hikes. As far as government support programs, we saw some of those ended, including the moratorium on evictions, but others did initiate, notably the 100 million housing fund that was recently announced by the state to incentivize the creation of um, multi-unit housing. As far as building materials and labor goes, um, the cost for both of these has increased and there's been issues with supply chains and labor shortages, which have both put a greater strain in the housing inventory. And lastly, we tried to take a look at migration patterns. Unfortunately, there's still no solid data on this, but we did take a look at population data to help us understand this a little bit better. Our resiliency action for this theme is to encourage the availability of safe and affordable housing for residents of all incomes. I covered infrastructure. Um, generally speaking, you know, the overall system hasn't really changed in the past year. That's not enough time to make you know, large scale changes in the quality of infrastructure. Um, the big change in the last year has just related to project funding versus cost. Uh, we're at a time that we're seeing, you know, significantly more federal funds available than we would typically. Um, but the flip side of that is that, you know, towns need capacity to be able to leverage that. And so there isn't always an equitable distribution, especially if there are smaller towns that don't have the capacity for, you know, a lot of grant applications or extra grant management. Um, and then, you know, the cost side, the rising cost that Natalie just talked about, um, as well as rising interest rates that are going to you know, further compound the expense of that project if you're trying to debt finance it. In this draft, we also tried to cover a couple gaps that we had identified over the last year in the analysis we did last year. One of these was um, cell phone networks where we had actually uncovered a situation in Summersworth where screening practices by doctor's offices, you know, people had to you know, pull up in their car, use their cell phone to call the office, answer screening questions for COVID. Um, noticed that there was a big coverage gap on Route 108. Um, so the city staff has been trying to work with some of the carriers to close that gap. Um, since we were on the topic, we also talked about 5G rollout um, and the discontinuation of 3G services as part of the older network. Um, there's also a lot of attention on cybersecurity because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine and concerns that there might be, you know, additional ransomware or malware attacks that might 
you know, spread beyond just that area of conflict. And then thinking about how to improve our resiliency on this topic, um, you know, we thought of a few things, regionalism and collaboration as a way to you know, share the load, take advantage of economies of scale, good planning, both as a way to improve the system resiliency by avoiding you know, potential pitfalls or vulnerable areas, uh, but also just for consistency of messaging and maintaining the public support that's important for you know, keeping a steady funding stream for these projects. So in terms of the traffic volume, the traffic is returning to the pre-pandemic levels with rising vehicle miles traveled, um, but funding continues to be an issue um, in terms of um, long-term maintenance of the highway network. Although there were fewer cars on the roads in 2020, the new driving habits that drivers developed, such as reckless driving and speeding, resulted in a number of fatalities that was consistent with previous years. Um, and then we've seen higher gas prices um, caused by the Ukrainian-Russian conflict, which led to increased interest in electric vehicle purchases, um, but the long-term effects are still to be determined. So in order to develop um, an EV charging station network in New Hampshire, we're currently working with municipalities to identify potential sites to develop a strategy to achieve um, ready status for currently pending corridors. Um, public transportation continues to be hurting. Coast ridership is still at 50% below the pre-pandemic levels. And despite the importance of public transit to New Hampshire's economy, um, public transit continues to be critically underfunded. Um, and as the New Hampshire's senior population grows, the need for the manned response transportation services will also continue to increase. Um, and the demand for coast paratransit service grew from 2008 to 2018 by 880%. Um, and the cost to provide these services grew by 744%, which makes up more than 25% of their budget. So in order to make the region more resilient um, in terms of mobility and accessibility, we're currently working on a bike pit survey, which will hopefully um, help develop networks that are more accessible and resilient in the face of disruption. For age friendliness, um, I moved resiliency up to the top because I think it sort of is a resiliency strategy in its own right. Um, you know, when I think of age friendliness, I'm thinking not only considering the impacts that things have on people of all ages, but thinking um, specifically about how uh, and recognizing that not all age cohorts have the same lived experiences and that certain barriers might be age specific. Some examples related to vaccine rollout you know, a lot of that, some of it was done by, um, you know, essential professions, but a lot of it was done by age. So when people were able to return to work or return to normalcy, depending on when they were able to get vaccines, which, you know, frequently depended on how old they are. Um, and to note, we still don't have a vaccine for children under five. Um, you know, some possible follow along effects of that then families with children, um, you know, even after schools or daycares have reopened in person, have dealt with a lot of uncertainty because of, um, you know, teacher shortages or if teachers get sick and they can't staff the classroom, they have to close. If kids are showing symptoms, they have to go through testing or isolation protocols that, you know, are, are cutting down on the predictability of childcare. Um, we've seen some employment changes as well. The actually the older workers and um, above traditional retirement age and the under 18 workers have been the employment you know, age cohorts that have come back to work closest to their pre-pandemic levels already. Um, and that traditional age workforce in 25 to 65 has been slower to return back to where they had been. Um, you know, this could be impacts of childcare or it could be other decisions that people are making about their lives. Um, and then finally, the rise in housing costs have, have been a big topic lately. Um, but again, to note that doesn't impact people of all ages or stages of their life equally. Um, for young people who have high uh, debt to income ratios because of student loans or others, or who haven't had the time to save for a down payment, it can be difficult to get into the housing market. On the flip side, seniors, especially those living on fixed incomes, are also worried about housing costs. 
Yeah, so for workforce and education, again, uh, we saw a loss in labor force participation, which was caused by factors such as lack of affordable house, um, housing and childcare. In our region, the workforce groups of ages 18 and under and 65 and over have recovered the fastest, but recovery has been slower for workforce groups ages 25 to 64. When talking about unemployment percentages, yes, unemployment is low, but that's not the full story, meaning that many people have left the labor market, which has led to severe worker shortages, despite the fact that the number of people unemployed is low. We've seen employers seeking innovative solutions, meaning that they have come up with new strategies for attracting and retaining employees, such as wage increases, sign on and stay on bonuses, increased benefits and flexible scheduling options. We've also seen innovative solutions across the education sector where educational uh, institutions are adapting their curricula to reflect a changing employee market and the current needs of employers. For resiliency, um, our resiliency action is to encourage and help businesses and institutions adapt to circumstances as these change to increase their chances for success in a rapidly shifting environment. So we've heard from multiple partners that there's an interest, increased interest in our communities, especially from out-of-state workers and businesses that are attracted by the high quality of life, the beauty of natural resources, the quality of healthcare and education, and vibrant and historical downtowns in our region. Um, outdoor dining continues to be very popular for local residents and visitors alike, um, although the regulations can be quite challenging for the smaller businesses to navigate um, as permits and insurance costs can be quite as expensive and they're still being issued on a year by year um, assessment. Arts and culture have slowly started to return um, and the attendance is at 65 to 75% of the pre-pandemic levels. Um, most of the federal um, and state recovery grants have expired, which makes it extremely difficult for the smaller venues that are still struggling to find funding. And it will probably take performing arts industries another year or two to offset the ticket losses caused by the pandemic. Um, we've also noted um, open green and outdoor spaces as important indicators of community vibrancy, especially for the smaller, more rural communities, um, as there's many economic benefits of walking, biking, and outdoor recreation, um, such as business creation and expansion, um, increased spending by locals and visitors, and improved desirability factor for housing located, need, uh, located near to recreation opportunities. So in order to make our communities more vibrant and resilient, we will continue to promote arts and culture initiatives, improve access to safe green and outdoor spaces that will hopefully help strengthen community cohesion and um, continue engaging with small businesses. Um, in the, the child care theme, uh, we talk about insufficient availability, which was an issue prior to the pandemic, but has been worsened by teacher shortages, um, centers that closed due to COVID-19 and restrictions that um, reduce capacity of the child care centers. Uh, additionally, high costs to parents, um, where parents in Stratford County can expect to pay an average of $13,000 per child each year. Um, and this amount barely covers the expenses that the center needs to cover to stay open, um, including salaries, food, and, and building expenses. And then unpredictable coverage, as James noted in age friendliness, um, if, if a child is sick, they must stay home until they're better. And if the teachers are sick or if there's a shortage of substitutes, um, this can result in the child care center closing entirely while um, everyone is quarantined. This makes it impossible to have predictable coverage day to day. So the resiliency addendum summarizes all of the projects and initiatives that we've executed over the past year using the CARES um, money with the help of SRPC staff and interns that we've hired. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, um, but the, the initiatives and projects are summarized in the addendum and they're um, explained in detail.
Uh, and then you know, finally, we've got the priority project list. Um, I was in front of all of you a month ago to talk through some of the details of the project. So I'm not gonna go through them again here, um, except to note that you know, we are still working to get information about a few of the pending projects. Um, there were two from Farmington that we're still trying to follow up. Uh, one of the ones that Mike Babinski uh, brought in front of you briefly at the last meeting was the um, issue of Turnpike Exit 10. Um, we did have some follow-up conversations and we think that at least for now, SRPC sponsoring that as one of our projects makes sense because it's in the 10-year plan. We'll have the ability to actually track um, you know, that project and advocate for it uh, as the MPO. But then once we start to get towards the implementation phase, um, you know, we may not have the same information that the cities might have, um, you know, especially if you get into things like uh, LPA management and things like that. So we're proposing to add that. Um, we're working on the form right now, but I haven't had a chance to get that in front of all of you. Um, and then I have also had some follow on conversations with the city of Rochester about their river walk. This has been a SEDS project in the past, and I think they had sort of lost momentum on the project for a little bit. They're hoping to bring that back. Um, so we would anticipate getting a form in front of all of you prior to adoption for that as well. Um, so we're almost done just to wrap up looking at the key dates going forward. Again, we released the plan for public comment on May 6th, EDA requires a 30-day public comment period. So that means we'll be accepting them through the end of business on Monday, June 6th. Um, because of the turnaround timeline, that does need to be a pretty firm deadline for us because we're planning to prepare a public comment log um, as staff tracking all of the comments we received and any changes we made to the plan in response over the course of the next week. And we would like to be able to get those into your meeting packets at the end of the week um, on June 17th. So the, the June policy meeting will be coming back for the noticed public hearing um, and then be asking you to adopt the plan at that point. The easiest way for you to provide comments is either in what time we have today to chat about them or just send me a, an email directly um, and I'm taking the lead on compiling all of those things, but I'll definitely share with um, the section authors as well if there are specifics that they need to address. So with that, any comments or questions? Okay, let's start the room here. Does anybody have uh, anything to, to offer on this? Or any questions they have at this time? what we'll do um, if it's helpful uh, for Karen and Larry if we get you a hard copy of this document because you can sit back it's chock full of information and, and I think it would she'd absolutely prefer to do it online it might be helpful to have it that would be great uh, anybody else that wants one as well please let Jen know yeah I already sent Megan a message to print two copies so if they want more copies I'll send her a message to send print a few more copies as well and as to uh, online, uh, Tim, is there anything that you had any questions, comments on at this time? Uh, not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Michael? I'll just note on, on the transit ridership, we're closer to 65 to 70% pre-pandemic and some routes, particularly Summersworth Dover and Summersworth Dover Rochester routes are higher. That we come back higher. So the last two, three months, I've seen ridership really grow. The lifting of the mask mandate has seen ridership people come back. Okay. Um, I did have, I have one quick question, maybe James. Um, I, I saw the I saw how the document gets distributed and where where it gets distributed, and uh, there was. Uh, considerable uh, focus on Summersworth and Dover and Rochester. And I was just wondering with the other communities, I don't know whether there's a certain place in, in all the other communities, the 18 communities, um, 
like your library or a town building or something where you know you typically house hard copies for the members of the public to come into. But if that's the case, then you can make some kind of arrangements to have it, have it sent to those locations as well. Make sure you have a hard copy to bring to, to your respective location. So we make sure there were a number of online sources and all that, but the, sometimes it was a personal touch is also a good thing if there's a place where people in the community gather to yeah, Dave, the point is well taken. Um, yeah, and I think you know, we put them in the places we did, I, I think in part to take advantage of you know, just the scale and the number of people who might be able to see them in the cities um, because they're somewhat centrally located. That's where we typically post like tip amendments and things like that. Um, so I'm sort of following Colin's lead, um, but you know, it, it's a great idea to try and make this more accessible and get copies out to other communities. Um, yeah, I would say that might be something that for those of you who are there in the room today, you could help us with if you are willing and able. Um, you know, if Megan's already printing copies, maybe she can print a few more if you all want to take one back to your town hall or your library or wherever you think makes the most sense. Um, I, the notice has already gone out and only listed uh, those two locations each in, in each of the three cities. So people may or may not know to look for it in, in your community, but you know, we're, we're happy to send hard copies out on request, um, you know, however people would prefer to access the information so you can all see it and give us your feedback. Can I get a digital copy also from From our website. It's on our uh, website. Yeah, Bill, I can send you the link again if we need it. That way we can download it to our uh, town website. Yep. Great. All right. Well, um, if there aren't any questions, thank you. Uh, James and Natalie, Rachel and Susie, I hope I got everybody there. Great presentation. There's obviously a lot of work on this and um, you know, you pared it down for us and, and, that, and that's great, but I would encourage anybody to, to read the document. Uh, it's chock full of useful information. And so uh, certainly be a great starting point for people that are just joining the board too. I really feel that way. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, on, it, Peter, I'm sorry. it is a great document. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, are we thinking at all about, you know, and again, the same charts and statistics are behind this. Are we thinking again about ways to move beyond just the printed document to make all of this easily available online, not just as a PDF document, but so that you can come into each of the sectors and basically see that data and you know like the maps and the charts and everything on, on this are great but it would be nice to continue to move closer and closer to an always published online you know so this is an ongoing update kind of thing are we thinking about that at all we are indeed um and i closed um, but Rachel, could you perhaps talk a little bit about the process on the data snapshot where we extracted all of the um, data from and kind of the next steps uh, along those lines? And I'm going to pull up our website while you do that. Um, I could, but that's at the tail end of our presentation on the data snapshot that's on the agenda in a few minutes when we switch back to policy. <laughs> Just warming you up. There you go. As part of that, um, can I maybe just um, call on Jackson at the end of that presentation to share um, what you've done for the data snapshot uh, in ARC Online? We'll be giving a tour of that as well. We'll we've got a, a short presentation about the document. We'll uh, highlight a couple of pages that we really love, and then we'll uh, dive into the ARC Online version as well. You're ahead of us, Peter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, just, <laughs> just so much anticipation. Yeah, just, uh, just put up with us, please. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. 
So move it, but we're switching to the MPO portion. Yeah. Hey. Just have that one action item before we get to the fun stuff. Okay. All right. Uh, we do have one action item that has to do with the draft minutes from the April 15th meeting. April 15th, 2022 meeting. And I, did I get a motion on that? Somebody? Tom in a second. So, Bill, anybody have any questions or comments about the minutes from the last meeting? Um, we do need to do a roll call because we do have one voting member on. All right. Okay, Tim, we're going to start with you. Acceptance of the uh, minutes. Uh, I vote yes. Uh, Bill? Yes. Richard? Yes. Peter? Yes. Mike? Abstain. Here, Glenn? Yes. Karen? Abstain. Um, okay, Larry. Okay, Dave, yes. Okay, Connor. Rachel, you guys all set the share on your end? Yes. Um. Just trying to find the right window real quick, sorry. All right, um, so today we're gonna talk to you a little bit about our uh, regional data snapshot. Um, there we, go. Uh, we published the document on April 25th. Uh, I did post an update la uh, late yesterday afternoon, just fixing a couple of uh, small edits that we realized were um, needed after we posted it. It consists of over 100 data metrics. Um, it, as of right now, includes a static PDF document and an interactive web map, but we are working on preparing a series of Excel files with tabular data that can be downloaded and used. Um, if there is a, a, a good solution that we can use to have those more interactive, we can look into that as well. Um, so this is the second year that we've had this document. Last year, it was um, this old layout here on the left. And this, uh, so last year it was a page of text and charts followed by a full page map. This year we have um, stuck to one to topic per page and arranged it so that it's uh, text, chart, and corresponding map all together on one page. Uh, the document is broken into an introduction and five chapters, demographics, economic vitality, livability, quality of life, mobility and accessibility, and resiliency. Um, so there are a number of metrics in, in each of these chapters. And with this new layout, we were able to add a lot more content without extending the length of the document by much. Um, so the, the new topics are, are flagged here um some of the new topics for demographics are new data that is specifically available through the decennial census um, while others are from data sources that we weren't uh, able to incorporate last year economic economic vitality we had built out pretty well last year so we only added a few more metrics this year um, livability we added quite a bit too Mobility and accessibility is a very long chapter, um, and we did not add very much this year. And resiliency, we built out this chapter quite a bit this year as well. Um, so where do we find it? Uh, the static PDF can be found on our website at this link, and the uh, interactive web map can be found here. Um, so we'll go to this one. Uh, so from this page right now, it's a uh, link to this year's document, last year's document, and an unemployment, um, COVID-19 unemployment snapshot that we released la last May. Um, one, uh, we need to still link the web map here, and then when the Excel files are available, they'll be on this page as well. Um, so for now, we click here. Um, and to access the document, click on the um, first page. 
so just to give you a quick tour of the, the PDF, um, the introduction has some data disclaimers and information about sources and performance measures. Each chapter has a table of contents. And then we'll just quickly highlight a few of these. Um, and I will zoom in because I know that in the room they're small and hard to see. Uh, so the group quarters population, uh, this metric is new this year. Uh, this is one of the decennial census data points that um, was a little outdated last year because the, the most recent data available was from 2010. So this year we have 2020 data available. Um, our largest category of group quarters residents in the region are uh, college students in UNH dorms and followed by nursing facilities and dedicated re residential care and correctional facilities. And then um, limited English proficiency is one that we have added this year. Um, Limited English proficiency is a metric of people over the age of five who do not speak English at least very well. Uh, and this is a, I believe it's environmental justice. Um, uh, title six. Title six, okay. This is a Title six metric. Um, so we'll be discussing this in the Title six plan later this year as well. Um, Mark and Stephen, can you remember, remind me which one is next? That's me, that's workforce by age. Okay, uh, this one. Yeah, so um, this comes from a really good source of the census. It's a longitudinal employment survey they put out. Um, they have really good data about the age of workers in various, um, usually at the county level sometimes by race, sometimes by um, occupation and industry. Um, but we really wanted to take a look at um, the age breakup pre and post COVID. Um, as we know in New Hampshire, the um, under 18 workforce is very seasonal, particularly up north in the lakes region. Um, so that took a huge dive in 2020. Um, we were interested to see the over 65 workforce um, just because so there wasn't quite as big of a dive. So it seemed like that as a more vulnerable population had to work, had to go back to work during the pandemic. Um, and then on the next slide, um, there's um, a little bit about the um, freshly graduated population, the mid twenties group and the um, established like middle-aged workforce. Um, and they've had a little bit more difficulty recovering from the pandemic. Um, and in New Hampshire, they, that, those workforces were a little bit more on the decline already. So um, this was just really interesting to us. Yeah, so inflation, we looked at consumer price index um, because we thought that was the best uh, uh, metric to use to analyze inflation because it measures the average price uh, paid for goods and services. Uh, we thought this was an important metric, especially recently uh, brought about uh, in the wake of the uh, COVID pandemic, and then also exacerbated by uh, the uh, Russian invasion of U Ukraine, which has had profound impacts on food and energy prices. Um, we wrote this report uh, with the data as of uh, February of 2022, um, likely meaning that it, this chart only would get worse and look, those, those uh, would only get higher as it goes on. Um, and we, these charts are also looking at um, inflation percentages in a year over year basis, meaning the data is relating to the previous year. Um, in no period in the last 30 years has the average uh, year over year inflation increased over 6%. Um, and that's kind of where we are with 2022 right now, um, but we're still early. So it'll be interesting to see uh, the effects of increased interest rates and other contractionary economic policy that will be used to con combat this uh, inflation. Uh, this was another one we were interested in, um, just pre and post COVID. Um, 
Um, as we know, uh, Terrell County and a lot of those northern communities in the region have a higher median age, um, but still Stratford County grandparents seem to take on that uh, parenting role a little bit more often. But um, this number uh, clearly dropped off during COVID. Um, maybe that was just due to economic hardship or just not wanting to be around kids in that um, for um, healthcare reasons. So again, just another interesting COVID one. Um, New Hampshire is a very um, active state for voter participation. Again, in our region, in the northern areas, um, a little bit more just because of a higher median age versus a younger median age in the southern communities. Um, Durham stands out just because it is the home of UNH, but even, again, places like Summersworth, um, lower voter participation. Um, and this year, it was interesting just to compare the absentee voters versus the in-person voters. Uh, so broadband, broadband access is not a new metric this year. Um, all of the others that we're looking at today are. Um, but what's different about broadband this year is the definition that we're using. So in last year's data snapshot, we used a 2015 definition of broadband, which was a little slower than um, the new definition used in the infrastructure bill. Um, so we made sure that the analysis on, on this map and the maps on the following page um, corresponded with the definition of broadband that is using, uh, being used in the upcoming funding through the infrastructure bill, um, which is 100 megabits per second downstream and 20 upstream, um, whereas the 2015 definition was 25 downstream and 3 upstream. Um, and that's the, the other two maps for that. Um, and then another new metric this year is um, sidewalks. So this we added to go along with our bicycle of, uh, level of traffic stress analysis. Um, these are the locations and number of miles of sidewalks in each municipality. Um, our field team has collected this over uh, the 2019, 2020, and 21 um, data collection seasons, um, with the exception of Durham, which was collected by a, a vendor that they had hired. And so they shared the data with us. And we do not have UNH sidewalk data in Durham as well. So renewable energy was another interesting metric we wanted to tackle, um, comparing both kind of locally and then the other states in our region, um, kind of how we're stacking up. Uh, as you can see on the tables to the right, um, SRBC doesn't have, uh, the SRBC region doesn't really have um, a significant uh, renewable power network, uh, mainly just with the hydroelectric dams and the biomass pipeline that connects between uh, Rochester Turnkey and UNH. Um, other, the other local sources uh, definitely out, heavily outweigh um, the outside of the region, uh, especially in Portsmouth with the natural gas power plants and the coal power plants um, that uh, together uh, are about the same amount of capacity as the nuclear power plant down in Seabrook. Um, so it was interesting to see kind of where a lot of the the significant power sources are coming from, especially locally. Um, but we also wanted to focus on uh, uh, renewable energy in the future for, for New Hampshire in general. Um, so due to New Hampshire not having a significant amount of coastline uh, for uh, significant offshore wind power that Massachusetts is trying to implement, uh, much of New Hampshire's renewable energy future lies within solar energy. Uh, currently in New Hampshire, the primary um, uh, Solar energy uh, lives within residential and commercial sectors, not necessarily in the utility uh, sector yet. Uh, and it totals about 165 uh, megawatts, which is enough to power about 27,000 homes, uh, which is roughly enough to power the homes in Dover and Rochester combined. Uh, so we still got a long way to go um, uh, in terms of investment. Um, that we'll be seeing, that we'll be seeing, especially out of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill, and can kind of build us to be a much more resilient community um, and and region. 
And then this one was another one we thought was interesting, um, especially with the almost alarming uh, news stories we hear every year of, oh, there's record temperatures almost every year we see. Um, and, and, cur- and, you know, we, we want to kind of capture that here. Uh, currently, uh, according to the Union of Concerned Scientists, which is an MIT nonprofit, uh, Americans are uh, experiencing 30 days or more with an heat index of over 105 degrees will increase from 900,000 Americans, which is primarily in the southwest of the United States, to nearly 90 million if by mid-century if slow action is taken uh, to combat climate change. Uh, New Hampshire historically will not really uh, reach those uh, those levels of heat indexes, but uh, you know, for in terms of 90 degrees and above, we're going to be seeing increases of historically we saw maybe three uh, days a year. Um, and now that if we slow action is taken, we could see upwards of 50. Um, and so that is an alarming statistic that we wanted to highlight, um, especially in, in ways that we could t- kind of combat this extreme heat uh, without policy, especially in urban communities, um, can be kind of a, com- a very complicated problem. Uh, but a recent study in 2020 found that areas within a 10 minute walk of a park uh, can, do, can have as much as eight degrees cooler uh, than neighborhoods outside that range. Um, obviously, this depends on the size of the park and the amount of vegetation, um, but it was just an interesting thing to kind of promote uh, parks in urban areas. Um, so, yeah. And then did you want me to grab a screen share for the tour of the interactive web map, Rachel? Yeah, I'm just gonna click the link and show how to get to it first, but then I'll stop sharing. Um, so to get to the web map, we uh, go to our websites. Um, the fonts are not loading correctly. Um, the map viewer page here and click on, um, again, on the icon to open the map. And I'll stop sharing so that Stephen can take over. Was that the wrong screen? Let's see here. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yeah. Cool. So this is just the introductory page, um, just kind of highlighting how to use the map viewer um, and just a little introduction and then kind of disclaimer here at the bottom. Um, but digging into the actual map viewer. Um, so you just need to navigate up here to the layers here on the left. And then it's kind of broken down, it's broken down by the chapters of each part of the data snapshot and the maps that were used in each of them. So if we go into here in economic vitality, um, we can kind of look at you know, anything that we want uh, in this section uh, using this little um, eye here, that's, that's kind of the visibility um, uh, hide layers, it says. Um, but you know, you can turn this on and it's very interactive. Uh, so this is looking at work locations for residents. Um, so number of residents who work in this tract, uh, this is up in Farmington. Uh, some of this data is uh, either town data or tract or uh, block. Uh, it's going to change based off of what the data we used in the snapshot was. Um, but it's very interactive. You can uh, find basically all the information that is in the snapshot, uh, at least in the maps here. Um, and it's, it's great to be able to cycle through this and uh, definitely different little symbologies as well. Um, but pretty simple to use. Um, and yeah, it's this is kind of it. So um, very excited. Uh, big props to Jackson for putting this together. Um, it was definitely a lot of work. So is that. Okay. Well, um, thank you, Jackson and Stephen, Mark and Rachel. Uh, does anybody uh, ask a particular question? I do. I, do. I just, I, I think it's a, a great report. Um, you guys deserve a lot of credit. It's very professional. It's it's an, it's probably the best regional planning report I've seen in a long time. It's really good. It's, and it's so close. We're getting so close 
to being able to do what I keep talking about is, you know, I'd like to kind of see each one of these pages, like I said, rather than a PDF document, um, you know, the, the, the mapping system starts to hint at where that can go, but really having each one of these pages as a web page that not only lets you drill down in the map, but lets you drill to the real data, because each year we're just adding another year of data. So, you know, at some point this report be, should be come push button simple. You're just adding another year of data, uh, fancying up the graphs, the maps, and the charts. So this is, I'm really excited about this because this just kind of encapsulates um, the future of, of what we're gonna start to be able to do with data. And I'm really, really uh, proud of this staff that they're using these tools correctly. Really good. Yeah, I'll just kind of piggyback on what you just said, Peter, um, and just the tremendous amount of work that the, the team has put into this. Um, not only is it kind of going above and beyond and kind of pulling it all together in, in that final presentation, but the methodology behind it um, and, and how they're preparing the data, they're really kind of leading the edge in statistical analysis um, amongst our RPC peers. So rather than um, kind of the old way of doing things of just you know downloading a data set in a you know in a CSV file and working in Excel, they have uh, migrated everything that can possibly be scripted. It is scripted. It's run through um, our statistical package. Um, it goes and it goes to the cloud, pulls the data each year, and exports the results. Um, and so it's just the way that it's been put together. Um, it's taken a lot of time to get to this point. And so now we're, we're at the point where they can start playing and having some fun. Um, so because all that, that, there was a lot of background work that had to go into this. And so it's, it's been a two year process and they've done a tremendous amount of work. And then it's a big deal for internal workflow too. Oh, yeah. so much there's, there's the external facing stuff you guys see, yeah. but this, I think the original, one of the original ideas for this was I, Rachel doesn't need to have three separate requests for the same data set. So guys, hold on. We're going to do it all in one place. Mm -hmm. You can go get it. And so internal and external. So a lot of rank. Good. Yeah. In other words, our geeks are better than their geeks. <laughs> we got the best. We have the best. <laughs> We got a bunch of good people here. We did. Questions or no? I mean, it's excellent presentation. Uh, question: uh, How would you distinguish metric between topic and measurement? Rachel, I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't catch the beginning. A big truck went by me, so I didn't. Right here. <laughs> uh, must live on one, Route 125. Uh, how do uh, between a metric, a topic, and a measurement? A metric, a topic, and a measurement. Um, so, I think the, the topics were kind of just the big buckets that we could sort things into. Um, and then for simplicity's sake, I, we've just kind of been referring to each page as a metric or each chart as a metric and kind of using it not really in a clearly defined way. Um, I, don't, I don't know. Do you guys have anything to? Yeah, I would just say that we kind of take the metrics and we put them in those buckets of topics and we, you know, those are the names of each of the pages on the snapshot and then we you know then, then there's the bigger chapter buckets that we put them in as well so i would say that you know the metrics are the individual graphs uh, when the you know topics are the the name of the names of the pages so yeah and and i think that one thing we we go back and forth about a lot and we moved a lot of things from one chapter to another this year um is there's a lot of overlap between the topics and so some, um, for example, a lot of the 
um, the housing metrics in livability were in uh, demographics last year. And we moved them to livability because we wanted to tie them into the, the cost of housing discussion that um, existed in uh, purchase and rental price trends analysis in the livability chapter. Um, and so we, we moved things around to kind of have them tie into the whole um, whole story that we're trying to tell within a chapter so that um, things that are, are more um, things that, that strengthen the story are, are lumped together as best as we can. And I, I think on the metric definition, you and I have had some discussions, especially when, once we're taking the data from the data snapshot into sort of our other plans like the SEDS for reference. Um, yeah, I think a lot of times we've defaulted to using metric as a term because it's a little bit more general and a little bit more vague as opposed to for each metric discussing whether it's an indicator or a performance measure, um, you know, where an indicator is sort of you're following the data to get a sense of your bigger, broader conditions. Um, the metric may not tell you the whole story, but it's do you know, something you're following to try and understand that story. Um, whereas a performance measure is something that you theoretically have direct control over and you're using to measure yourself uh, and, and your progress towards a goal. Um, yeah, and at least on the economic development side, since you know economic indicators are, are all mixed together, we don't have a whole lot of performance measures. Um, so I, I think some of it might just have been the language and the parlance, and it was easiest to defer to something a little bit more general. Yeah, thank you, James. And then um, all of the the federal highways and federal transit um, required performance measures for transportation are all um, they're all in this document. The targets are not listed in the document right now, but um, the the back data that goes into setting targets each year is in this. And uh, thanks for the good comments. Anybody else here? Uh, online here, Tim? Anybody else? Yeah, actually, um, I was curious about something. Um, you had a slide earlier on in the presentation about limited English proficiency. And I mean, I've heard. Um, similar discussions uh, from at, at meetings of a couple of the other MPOs. And I'm just curious about uh, whether you've actually, is there any demand right now for um, translating, like for instance, MPO documents into other languages? Like have, have, you, have you received any requests? We haven't so far, and I, I think, um, I don't know if that is because there aren't that many, that, I don't know if that's because of the number of people who truly have limited English proficiency or the fact that they're just, because it's not there, they're not looking for it. Um, so I think it's a bit of, it's a chicken and egg thing. And I think it, that's part of what we've been looking at with our Title VI update um, is how do we, how do we incorporate those people in the process? Um, so I, I don't know if that's a true answer to your question, um, but I, I think it's something we're, we're grappling with a little bit. Um, yeah, I think it does. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just have a, a couple of, of other business things. Um, the TAC meeting in June, I forget if it's June 4th or June 3rd, uh, June 3rd in two weeks, we're going to have a little panel of folks uh, at the municipal level looking at EV charging. Um, 
this is sort of an informal panel discussion. We've got um, someone from Durham who they have a couple of, of public chargers in town. Uh, we have uh, someone from Dover who's a resilience coordinator there. And then we've got some, some friends from the Southern Maine Planning and Development Commission who have been doing a lot of uh, solar and, and EV charging over that way. Uh, so we've, we've heard a bunch from the kind of federal perspective and uh, the broad scope of funding that's going to be available soon, um, but want to get some on the ground. What's what's actually happening? Uh, as, as folks are thinking about that, and it's it's moving forward, whether we want it to or not. Um, so, just a preview of that. Um, oh, the the bicycle pedestrian plan survey is out. It's on our website, and I think it was out in a newsletter recently as well. Um, so if you if you haven't had a chance to fill that out, please do by your input um, and send it to, to whoever uh, you can think of in the region. Uh, where that's that's part of our, our early plan development process, and uh, it's really helpful to get feedback. I think that is it for me. Unless Jen has other we're just kind of on other business and staff updates and stuff. Yes, did we mention executive committee alternate? We have a couple of seats open for alternates on the executive committee. Um, if anyone is interested, please uh, reach out to Megan or I uh, if you'd like to nudge somebody into being uh, an executive committee alternate member. Please reach out to Megan or I and we can help you nudge. Uh, we do have um, our existing seven uh, exi executive committee members are all interested in, in retaining their seats, but we could always use the an alternate or two just in case. Um, so, if I could just add one thing to that, I uh, I wasn't sure. I don't know now. A couple of years ago or whatever it was, I wasn't sure exactly what what it even meant to be on the executive committee, and I. I decided, well, why don't I attend one of the meetings? And so I attended the meeting, and uh, I think uh, that, did it, that did it for me. And uh, <laughs> so I, I think it's, I think with many people, I know myself, especially when I hear about a committee, unless I already pretty much know what goes on, which isn't typical of me, um, you know, I have to find out by attending. So just encourage people to, uh, you know, over the course of the next couple of months, yes. come join us for the meeting. It precedes this meeting. It starts at eight o'clock, and uh, we're all a friendly group, and we're welcoming. So, thank you. Sure. Uh, just a one more plug. Just a reminder that the bipartisan infrastructure law. It included additional funding for programs like transportation alternatives and uh, the congestion mitigation, air quality. Those cover a pretty broad range of project types. Um, and there will definitely be solicitation rounds held by DOT in, in the near future. If you have project ideas, transportation alternatives are specific to non-motorized, so sidewalks, bike trails, multi-use trails. Um, if you have project ideas, Many of them will probably include the requirement or will, will need data collection as, as part of that. So if you have project ideas, now is the time to reach out. Um, the data collection season is just getting underway and it's certainly a lot easier to fit um, additional requests in early in the season and find a slot for them than it is in, in the fall. Uh, so earlier is better if you want data collection. Uh, and then that project that is just welcome to reach out to me. I'll add one last thing. Annual meeting is coming up on June 23rd. Everyone should have received a save the date invite. Um, for that, we uh, will be doing so in person uh, at uh, Governor's Inn. And the theme this year will be arts, culture, and placemaking. So stay tuned, there'll be more information coming out likely weekly and a little bit more frequently as we get closer.
Okay, finally, anybody, uh, anybody, any of the commissioners have anything they want to share from a particular community that's going on that you want to share with the rest of us? And, and this is your time. And, uh, it's very quiet. Um, so I guess with that, uh, I don't think there's anybody at the Citizens Forum, but I don't think we have anybody online there. No, nope, present. All right, with that, fantastic presentations, everybody. It was very enjoyable. Looking forward to playing around in there and check, checking that out. I, I'm excited about it. Um, get a motion to adjourn. Tom, second. I go. All in favor? Aye. 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 We'll include you in that eye there, Tim. All right. All right.